I love boxing. I love pugilism. That's the word, right? Pugilism. But I love boxing in the, in the championship rounds. You know what I mean by the championship rounds? It's when you get to those last few rounds when all of your strategy has been kind of uh, out there, when all of your tactics have been uh, discovered, your corner knows where things stand. They know pretty much if you're behind or ahead. And they know that these next few rounds will determine the winner of the fight. Has your training been adequate to this point? Do you have the stamina and the strength and the metal to make it all the way to the end. These are the championship rounds of the match. What will it take for you to be victorious? Paul mentions something about this, the Apostle Paul, uh, when he talks about in 1 Corinthians 9, the self-control of an athlete and, and trying to go for the winning the imperishable prize, the imperishable wreath. And boxing with a purpose. He says, I, I don't box at the air, but I box with purpose. Boxing metaphors in the scripture. And so as the Apostle Paul wraps up 1 Timothy chapter 6 this morning, he gives some final instructions. These are the championship rounds of the letter to his prize fighter and to us this morning. What is going to get us through to the end of the bout. And he'll discuss in this section here two empty cravings that can distract us and disarm us as leaders in the divine household. And then he will talk about one eternal focus that will help us make it all the way to the end. So let's talk about these two empty cravings that we can. That, that can distract us, that can lead us off the path here. So if you'll turn in your Bibles, 1 Timothy chapter 6, starting in verse 3 this morning, we'll finish up all the way to the end of the letter. 1 Timothy 6, starting in verse 3. Let's begin with the craving of controversy. This is a theme that he begins his letter with, and he ends this letter with in 1 Timothy. He says, Timothy, teach and urge these things. Just like he said in 1 Timothy 1 3, urge you, I urge you, Timothy, to remain at Ephesus. He says, teach and urge these things. Verse 3. If anyone teaches a different doctrine, again, chapter 1, verse 3, charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. If anyone teaches a different doctrine, and then he says, and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 1, verse 10 and 11, the sound doctrine in accordance with the gospel. Same words almost. And then he says, in the teaching that accords with godliness. Jesus Christ himself being the mystery of godliness. Chapter 3, verse 16. It says, verse 4, he is puffed up with conceit. He is, Paul says in another part of this letter, uh, like a recent convert, puffed up with conceit. And he understands nothing. Chapter 1, verse 7, he's without understanding either uh, in what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions, he says. So I hope you're seeing and hearing all of these very similar themes going on, both at the beginning of this letter and the end. It says that this kind of person, in verse uh, 4, has an unhealthy craving for controversy. And he quarrels about words. Again, chapter 1, verses 4 and 6, he's devoted to myths and endless genealogies, which promote speculation and vain discussion. And these sorts of people produce certain things. Let's see what the outworking of this kind of controversial person produces. It says it produces envy. We began to covet what doesn't belong to us. Leadership roles, status, other people's possessions. It produces dissension. 
that the good orderliness of authority begins to erode. Slander. We talk about one another behind each other's backs. Evil suspicions. We begin to believe the worst instead of the best about one another. And verse 5, constant friction. There's a spirit of underlying bickering that goes on in the church among people who are depraved in mind. Their minds have been corrupted. Their minds have been distorted and deprived of the truth. There's a famine of the word of God. Imagining that godliness is a means of gain. More on that in just a moment. Have you been, ever been in a church that has moved on from Scripture? We, we've kind of graduated from all of that. Have you ever been in a church like that? Friends, when we eliminate the source of truth and the source of beauty and the source of goodness, the revelation, the very revelation of God in his word, the very words that are breathed out by God to us about him and about his plan for this world, the craving for quarrels and controversy begin. Doesn't it? And then we get all of these things, the envy and the, and the dissension and the slander and the suspicions and the constant friction. Don't we? You ever been in a church like that? It's not a fun place to be. Now, therefore, because all this is true, because there can be unhealthy cravings for controversy in the church, Paul now provides Timothy, if you skip all the way down to chapter 20 and 21, or I mean verses 20 and 21, he provides Timothy an antidote for this disease. He tells Timothy, O oh, Timothy, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Meaning guard the word. Guard the fidelity and the integrity of the scriptures of right teaching of sound doctrine. It says the same thing in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 14. Guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irrever irreverent babble and contradictions. The Net Bible says, uh, avoid profane chatter and absurdities. You know what profane means? Profane means anything that's not divine. It's, it's lowering what is divine and good and perfect and beautiful and concentrating on all of the getting down in the muck and the mire. Sorry, Ken. I know you're here. That wasn't a reference to you, Ken Muck. Avoid the irreverent babble. Avoid the contradictions. Avoid the profane chatter and the absurdities of what is falsely called knowledge. For by professing it, some have swerved, departed from, gotten off the right path from the faith. Friends, what are you listening to? What has got your ear lately? I just have to say, for those of you that are, have been coming to this church, you know we sent out an email about the election a, few, a couple weeks ago. And I will tell you that the, the, the overwhelming response is discouragement, such discouragement. And guess what? The, mo the people that have been talking to me about this have said, the, the more I keep listening to this stuff, the angrier I get. The more disgusted I get, the more discontented I get, the more angry I get, the more angst-filled I get. And so I ask you the question, friends, what are you listening to? Is that stuff producing the fruit of the Spirit in your heart? Love, joy, peace, patience? It doesn't sound like it. When you're telling me, I think a, a, a long, steady diet of political stuff, just for example, leads to heartburn, not heart healing. I don't know, just me. Maybe you feel differently. But friends, the, the point is the more controversial, the more controversy we begin to take in to our ears, the less contented we are. You know what the most valued commodity is of our day? Do you know what companies are paying millions of dollars for? 
your attention. That's what they want more than anything, your attention and your time. So I ask you again, what are you listening to? Guard the good deposit. Avoid irreverent, controversial, profane chatter and babble. Well, craving controversy leads to a second dangerous desire, by the way. And this comes right out of 5A. I said uh, that these people have been, uh, these people who crave controversy are now depraved of mind. They're corrupted in their minds. They've been deprived of the truth because they're not listening to Scripture anymore. And they imagine that godliness is a form of or leads to gain. So in other words, uh, becoming more religious by, remember if you remember a few weeks back, by, by not marrying, by not eating certain foods, by not drinking wine, by, this, by leading an ascetic lifestyle of giving up things, they thought that could be profitable financially. That's, who Paul, that's what Paul's addressing here. That somehow our religiosity can make us a living. But, Paul argues in verse 6, godliness with contentment is great gain. He says this in chapter 4, verse 8, that godliness is of value in every way, physically and spiritually. It's, it's godliness. Living a godly life is helpful in all ways. And so he goes on here just for, uh, to explain this positively, what he means by godliness with contentment. He says, for we brought nothing into the world... In the past, you didn't bring anything into the world with you, and we can't possibly take anything out of the world presently. This sounds a lot like Job chapter 1. Naked I came into the world, and naked I will go out. The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away, and what? Blessed be the name of the Lord. So you brought nothing into the world in the past. You can take nothing out of the world when you leave in the present but if we have food and clothing, he says, with these we will be, in the future, did you catch that? We'll be content. So friends, God has you covered, past, present, and future, in terms of everything that you need. Godliness, then, with contentment, helps calm our souls and be okay right where God has us. We don't desire more. We put our desires in line with what God has given us. And we go, we're going to be fine. We're okay. That's the positive of this godliness with contentment. This is the great gain. But in verses 9 and 10, he now explains that godliness, uh, or, or he explains godliness with contentment negatively by saying, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, in fact, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. And then we have this famous verse here, verse 10, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. And it's through this craving, this dangerous desire, that some have wandered away again from the faith. Almost the same language, swerving before, now wandering off the path and pierce themselves with many pangs. Now, just, just take a note real quick here of the words in these verses. Temptation, snare, senseless, harmful, ruin, destructions, evil, craving, wandering, piercing, pains. Anything good in there? The context, of course, is leaders in the church lusting after wealth or, or perhaps even lusting after prestige and status. And, and boy, everybody look at me. But, but the broader application is for all of us as Christ followers. The desire to be rich, the, the love of money, which is what? Which is 
which is envy, which is covetousness, which is wanting something that it's not, doesn't belong to me, that it, that it should belong to me. The love of that money causes all sorts of problems. And you know this is true. Coveting in our culture is ubiquitous. It's, it's everywhere. I was sitting over at my dad's house uh, a few days ago watching a few minutes of TV, and guess what? A, a pizza oven pops up on the TV. A pizza oven. For only $180, you can only, you'd think you'd spend $500, but no, today you can have this handy-dandy pizza oven for $180. And I'm thinking to myself, why does anybody need a $180 pizza oven? Just wondering. Friends, that's just one silly example, but I confess, this is all over our, our lives and our culture. I struggle with this. I struggle from time to time wanting that nice piece of land, honestly, just a few acres, not asking a lot here, with the house with the covered, uh, the uh, wraparound porch. I mean, is that too much to ask, God? Because I want stuff, because I desire to have more, just like you do. For others of you, maybe uh, it's waterfront property. Maybe it's the latest set of golf clubs. Kiddos, maybe it's the latest, greatest Xbox. Maybe it's, oh, I really want that iPhone 16 because I only have the iPhone 14 and I'm two generations behind now. You name it, we want it. That is the way our culture is designed the love of money. And so Paul then again in this section, he provides a second antidote. Skip down to verses 17 and 19. I'm just going to summarize this. An antidote to the desire for riches. Just like he gave the antidote to false teaching, the antidote for the desire of riches. He's basically paraphrasing here. says, if you have money, which is fine, God gives people certain amounts. It's okay. He says, just don't be proud about it. Don't be arrogant and puffed up that you have it and don't trust in it. Don't put all your trust in it because it can go away at any time that God chooses. Just, just one market correction away from it all disappearing. But if you have wealth, it's not evil. Share it. Be generous with it because using your wealth in this way produces eternal rewards and value for you. And for others. And it's true. It was true in the early church when they had wealthy Christ followers. And it's true in our church today. Wealth is not a bad thing. The love of wealth is a bad thing. So friends, we must be aware of our cravings of controversy and babble as well as our ever-present desire for dough. Either one can lead to our destruction Either one can keep the church from realizing its true potential, its true um, outpouring of God's love and grace and mercy upon our world. These are the keys to winning the prize fight in the championship rounds. These are why these are the last words from Paul. So you see what's happening here is in this section a literary device, a rhetorical device called a chiasm, where Paul says, here's an issue, here's the antidote. And then he says, here's another issue, and here's another antidote. And then we come to this middle section right here, and this is called a chiasm, because the, the text itself actually points to the very middle section that is the most important thing that he wants to say, which is the one eternal focus that we all should have. And here it is, verses 11 through 16. He says, but as for you, O man of God, and I will say to you, O people of God at Sturgeon Bay Community Church, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. 
take hold of the eternal life to which you are called and about which you make the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Flee, pursue, fight, take hold. Four present imperatives, four present commands, meaning they're, they're ongoing, they're continuous. Not one-time events, but, but always, every day when you wake up, flee, pursue, fight, take hold of, always. These are the, 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 the force of these um, verbs here, ongoing. And if you notice here, he's, he's outlining a path of repentance. To turn away from what is evil. Flee those things. Turn toward, run toward what is righteous and good and godly instead of wandering away from the faith, instead of swerving away from the scriptures. Timothy is called to pursue and fight for the faith. Instead of loving money, the love of money, it's all kinds of evil. Paul calls on Timothy to love virtue here in verse 11. Love what is righteous and godly and faith and love. Pursue these things. Love these things, not those things. And then he says this in verse 13 to 14, or 13 to 15. I charge you now, just like he charged him in the beginning, I charge you to urge, or I urge you to stay in Ephesus, but I charge you here now, in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Jesus Christ, who is his testimony, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. Now, Paul charged Timothy one other time this way in chapter 3, verse 21. Pastor Shane talked about that. And he, he does so again here. I charge you before the living God and before Jesus Christ himself. And we note the connection here that to fight the good fight of faith means to make the good confession of the faith. To fight the good fight, you have to make the good confession. Timothy did this in the church in verse 12. And this is what Jesus himself did before Pilate. Jesus proclaimed and lived out his faith publicly and didn't shrink back. When Pilate said, are you the king of the Jews? He said, well, you say that I am. Jesus' works, his actions, his attitudes, his desires, his godliness, his confession, all told a story to those around him that God is real, that he is true, that he is holy, that he is worthy of all praise. And guess what? It caused Pilate to proclaim, this man is undeserving of death. I find no guilt in him. And Timothy's confession told a similar story of the good ordering of creation in his church by our God. So he says, Timothy, make the good confession. And so friends, our confession of the faith must not merely be words spoken or doctrine affirmed, but, but lives that attest to, that align with the word of God. And so when we flee from false doctrine, when we quit striving after wealth and the love of worldly delights, then in verse 14, the commandment is kept unstained and kept above reproach. This is a huge theme for Paul in this letter, to be above reproach as leaders in the church, as followers of Jesus, to be above the fray, to be above what is profane, and to reflect the goodness of our God. A great man of the faith, his name's Mel Summerall, a saint that most, most people will never know who he is. He founded Denton Bible Church. At the time, he was the oldest uh, graduate of Dallas Theological Seminary uh, and uh, started a small uh, startup church 40 miles north of the seminary called Denton Bible Church with a group of, uh, of collegians. 
And Mel Summerall, I came into his ministry at the end of his, uh, the, near the end of his life. And you could drive by, you'd think this, the, the church blew up to 3,000 people. You'd think he'd be living high on the hog and you'd drive past Mel's house and it looked just like everybody else's in the neighborhood. You'd have never known. You walked into his house and he was humble, a humble man with humble uh, things around him. And he'd invite you in and he'd always call you brother. Hey brother, why don't you sit down here? And he'd always give you a big hug. And he'd always ask you, how's your walk with Jesus going? And even to the end of his life, well into his 80s, say, Mel, what are you doing? He'd say, well, I'm, brother, I'm discipling 12 young men in the faith, and I'm, I'm urging them to, to go to seminary and get out there into the mission field. And he was just as on fire the, day of, the last days and seasons of his life as he was at the beginning. And then he'd look right back at you and go, well, what are you doing for the faith? He was just a humble, loving gentle man. He contended well for the faith. Well, friends, make no mistake. Contending for the faith is a fight. Did you see that? Fight for the faith. It's literally the Greek word agonitsai. Where do we, what word comes to mind? Agonize. Agonize for the faith. It's not easy. But friends, our hope remains in verse 14. Our hope remains until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which will come at the proper time. Friends, our cry, despite the agonizai, despite the agonizing, despite the fight, is come Lord Jesus. For friends, this momentary light Affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, my life verse. But that said, our struggle, this prize fight, is powered by Jesus' resurrection power until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, his imminent return at any moment for us. That's what keeps the power going day in and day out. Come, Lord Jesus. Friends, as leaders in the divine household, our desires can neither be for controversy nor for wealth, but for God himself. That's it. There's no other, there's nothing else to put in that bucket. Jeremiah Burroughs, famous Puritan pastor, writer, uh, wrote this in the rare jewel of Christian contentment. He said, a soul that is capable of God can be filled with nothing else but God. Nothing but God can fill a soul that is capable of God. Though a gracious heart knows that it is capable of God and was made for God, carnal hearts or fleshly hearts think without reference to God. But a gracious heart, meaning one who has been transformed by Christ, being enlarged to be capable of God and enjoying somewhat of him, can be filled by nothing in the world. It must only be God himself. So friends, may we find hope in the presence only of our Father by the power of his Holy Spirit to have true godly contentment in the Son. May Christ alone be our eternal treasure and our good confession Verse 15 and 16, to he who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. And all of God's people said, Ben.